Good morning. Welcome to the Prairie Church of Christ this morning. It's nice to see so many of you logging on this morning and joining us uh, in our worship together. Uh, good morning. I see a few have said good morning and are, are uh, waving this morning, and so uh, it is good to have you with us. We're going to start this morning by singing Glory to His Name, number 548, Glory to His Name. Thank you uh, so much for who you are, what you've done for us, and we thank you that we could gather here today in your name. Father, let all things that we do this morning be pleasing in your sight, for it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's be singing number 463, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder.
Number 72, Thou Art Worthy. Thou Art Worthy. Nice to see all of you here today. I see quite a few. I don't know how active these Facebook counts are, but uh, right on my screen it says we have 24 people uh, joining us this morning. And I know that there are some of you who are, there's multiple people listening on one account. Uh, and so it's uh, really nice to see this. And I know that there are others who watch this service uh, afterwards uh, and are blessed by it. And I just want to pray uh, and, and hope that you pray with me that our church is able to continue to reach out and spread that message about Christ, about his love and his good news uh, in every way we can during this uh, stay at home order. We are coming to our time of prayer. And if you have a prayer request, I hope that you'll uh, put it on the, on the comment uh, section uh, this morning. And if I catch it, uh, we will pray for it. Uh, we will pray for it now. Um, and if uh, and if I, don't, I can always pray for it later, we can all be joining in prayer at a later time. We do want to uh, do want to pray for the Dewitt family. Uh, Christy Dewitt, uh, part of our church family here, passed away uh, this past week, and we want to pray uh, uh, for Jim and the girls uh, as they uh, are navigating uh, this this time uh, and mourning, and we mourn with them. Uh, other other prayer requests this morning? Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord. Uh, let's go to uh, the Lord in... Well, wait a minute. I see a comment first. I want to see this comment. Someone's saying, I, I'm trying to watch mine, and it wants to keep loading. I think because so many churches are utilizing Facebook Live on Sunday morning, I think I think that sometimes the system gets overload. Now I could be wrong about that, but for whatever reason, uh, for whatever reason, um, 
the, you know, some people have problems viewing this live. If you're having trouble viewing this live and you want to go back, later in the day, it usually takes me a while in the afternoon, but later in the day, I post the service uh, to prairiegreen.org. Uh, and you will be able to see it there. Also, uh, you may be able to go back and view it later here on Facebook, and the connection maybe should work uh, work better than when it isn't uh, at a peak uh, at a peak time. Okay. Uh, Joe is asking for prayers that the governor will make the strictures lighter for the less populated uh, areas uh, of the state. Um, and Joe, uh, what I can tell you is I am going to join and pray with you to pray that uh, that we have wisdom, that our that, that our governor has uh, wisdom and is able to make the right decisions. Um, sometimes it's really hard for us to tell what those uh, what those right decisions are. But but I've been praying for a long time uh, that this um, that this whole situation will end soon, that we can get back to doing the things that we need to do. And so we'll join in prayer for that as well. Uh, let's, uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer together. Father, um, thank you so much for this time that we have together. I thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, uh, for sending him for us to die in our place. Uh, it really was an amazing act of love. Father, when we look outside and, uh, we see all the world around us. We realize what a blessing it is that you've given us this life to live. Father, uh, we are sinners. We are in need of forgiveness from you. We don't deserve your mercy or your grace. But Father, we thank you that in Jesus we have those things. God, we are, uh, we are just asking that you would forgive us of our sins, even as, uh, even as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Father, thank you. Thank you for all the blessings that you've given us, whether it's the blessings in Christ. We have mentioned the blessings of life that we've mentioned, but also material blessings uh, for those who, uh, of us who have jobs or able to work. We thank you for that. Uh, for 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 houses to live in, uh, food to eat, all of the all of the things that sometimes we take for granted, we just thank you, Father. We do pray uh, for those who are uh, who are hurting right now. Uh, we think of the Dewitt family. We pray that you would help them as they're grieving and mourning. Uh, we pray for all those uh, who are grieving. Uh, uh, right now, and those who are uh, in challenged with sickness, I think Father of, of Carol Livingston, who is in the nursing home, and I I know that uh, there's just a loneliness uh, uh, there because she can't have visitors, uh, and many in that same situation. God, we just pray for them and lift them up, help help them, and let them know that you're with them. Uh, that you're right there beside them every step of the way. Father, we pray for those who don't know you. We pray uh, for those who have never been converted, who have never called on uh, the name of the Lord. We just ask uh, that you would work in each of those people's hearts and minds and in their life, put people in their way to share the good news with them and help us in some way to share that good news. Father, we, we do pray uh, for this nation and this state and our community. We pray that uh, for wisdom because we all need it. And our leaders need wisdom especially because there's so many tough decisions. There's so many things that have to be done. And Father, we just want this situation to be over with. But Father, God, we just ask for wisdom. Father, give your blessing and wisdom to President Trump, to Vice President Pence, to Governor Pritzker, to our members of Congress and our elected officials and judges, all of those who have to make decisions, Father. We think about our first responders, our police and our firefighters and our, uh, and our medical workers, Father. 
who had to make these life and death decisions every day. God help them. Give them wisdom in this time. Father, we do pray for we pray for our uh, for for those who are sick and hurting, for the families of those who are, are suffering. Father, we ask that you'd help them and heal them. For those who are out of work, for those who are fearful because they're losing their businesses, God, give help to all those who need help. Finally, God, we just pray for ourselves. Many of us are included in all these prayers we've, in some way or another, in all these prayers we've prayed before. But God, first and foremost, help us to draw closer to you. Help us to become more like Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. As we prepare for the Lord's Supper this morning, if you have, uh, if you have the bread and the cup with you, I hope that you will join us uh, today in partaking. We're going to be singing at, uh, at the cross, um, which is an interesting song to me because it, 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 it actually combines two songs. It combines an old hymn that was written by Isaac Watts, which is a very stately hymn uh, that describes the uh, suffering of Jesus Christ. And then this version of the song adds a chorus to it by Ralph Hudson, uh, I believe, is who wrote the chorus. And and the, the, the chorus is has more of, to me, has a more of a light, happy feel to it. And it's interesting to juxtapose those two together, but I think it kind of reflects what we think about when we think about the cross. Jesus suffered unimaginably for us. But because he suffered for us, and because we're forgiven through that suffering and death, we can have happiness and joy. And so when we come to the cross, we come in an attitude of repentance, but we also come, as it says in the scripture, to this cup of thanksgiving, attitude of thankfulness for what Jesus has done for us. Let's sing number 227 at the cross.
As they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take and eat. This is my body. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this, eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And at this time in our service, and when we have our services in the building, we have our offering, uh, offering time, uh, and our offering is uh, given to God, uh, and it is used uh, by the church. Uh, we pray in a wise manner to further his kingdom. If you have offerings that you'd like to send to the Prairie Green uh, Church of Christ, you can mail them to 278 North. 2800 East Road, Hoopston, Illinois, 60942. Or you can visit uh, prairiegreen.org and find uh, the Give tab at the top uh, and give that way. Let's be singing our doxology together. Praise God from It's sad, I think, what psychology does to you. It makes you think of things. Um, you know, the mind gets into habit. And when we sing the doxology and we say amen, the first thing, very first sentence that comes to my mind every time is, you may be seated and the children are dismissed for children's church. <laughs> now, the reason... Well, it's just simply a habit. It's, it's, it's part of what we do. And it's amazing how much uh, of what we do in church really is habit. But there can be good habits and there can be bad habits. Uh, and there's no better habit than being with the Lord's people and gathering in the Lord's name on the Lord's day. This is a wonderful habit to have. And I'm glad uh, that you're doing that with us today. If you have your Bibles, I want you to open them to Matthew chapter 19. Matthew chapter uh, 19, starting in verse 13. It says, Then children were brought to him, that he might lay his hands on them and pray. The disciples rebuked the people. But Jesus said, Let the little children come to me, and do not hinder them. For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. And he laid his hands on them and went away. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. We thank you for giving it to us. And we recognize that it's a message from you to us. And so in this time, Father, help us to take it seriously. Give us the wisdom uh, to apply it to our life. Give us the courage uh, and the desire and the grace to live it. Father, help me as I preach this message. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Children that honor God. Children that honor God. I don't know about you, but this has been one of my overarching prayers for my kids. I don't know who all is listening or watching this program today, but I know that at least some of my kids are watching it. Some of them are sitting here with me. Others of them are, who knows, running around the church building. But one of the things that I pray all the time for my kids is that they would grow up to be devoted followers of Jesus Christ. 
There are many in this world who are not devoted followers of Jesus Christ. There are many times in my life when I felt like I wasn't a devoted follower or I wasn't devoted enough. But I've wanted my kids to be. And I want my kids to be healthy and I want them to be happy and I want them to be successful. But I told God if I can't have any of those other things, I want them to follow you. I want them to follow you. Do you want children that honor God? Do you want children that honor God? And for those of you uh, who, who are watching this, maybe in the grand uh, child phase of your life, you want grandchildren that follow God, that honor Him. Well, this scripture, I think, teaches us something about children, what our attitude toward children should be like, what God's attitude toward children is, and what we can do to raise children who honor God. Number one, if you want children that honor God, bring your children to Jesus. If you want children that honor God, Bring your children to Jesus. It's a very interesting text to me because the disciples here sort of get upset at the kids uh, for coming uh, to Jesus. He, they come to him. He prays uh, with them. He lays his hands on them to give them a blessing. And it says the disciples rebuke them. Now, the way the grammar is worded here, the, the implication is the disciples rebuke the kids. Get off Jesus' lap. Get away from here. We don't have time for this. We have places to be. We have things to do. But it says here in the very first part of this section that those children came because they were brought to Jesus. Those children came because they were brought to Jesus. I had a friend who went to the Holy Land uh, and he said that when... Uh, that when he went to the Holy Land, one of the interesting things was is that children would just appear. They seemed to appear uh, out of nowhere. And uh, the same thing would happen if you gave a child something on the street, uh, if you gave a child money or you gave them a gift or someone like that on the street, all of a sudden 10 more kids would appear out of nowhere wanting the same thing. And so in these ancient cultures, in this Middle Eastern uh, sort of context, maybe we could say the kids just showed up one day. And we see that. We saw that earlier uh, in, uh, when Jesus entered uh, his triumphal entry. And then in the courts of the temple, the children were just dancing around the courts of the temple uh, singing Hosanna to the son of David. Children just show up. But here it says they were brought. Someone brought them to Jesus. Someone brought them to Jesus. And in this passage, it doesn't say who brought them. Was it a parent? Was it a grandparent? Was it a friend? Who was it? Well, if you have any kind of child in your life, and you want them to honor God, do your best to bring them to Jesus. When I was manager at the Prairie States Christian Service Camp, I used to go around to different churches and I would challenge the people of the church to send someone to camp this year. Find someone. You know, a lot of our churches were in a place where it's like they didn't have kids in the church anymore. And they'd say, uh, they'd say to me, you know, well, Dustin, don't bring very many brochures because we just don't have very many kids. And I'd say, well, don't you have grandkids? Don't you have nieces and nephews? And I used to tell them, if you have a child or a grandchild or a niece or a nephew or some neighbor kid that you want to get rid of for the week, send them to church camp. You know, if you want children that honor God, bring your children to Jesus. That's a very general statement. Here they were literally brought to Jesus. How do we bring our children to Jesus? Well, it's something that parents struggle with, something uh, that, that, that they don't understand. Something that they don't understand. I knew a family where the, 
the husband and wife, they were believers, but they sort of had wandered away from the family faith. They had wandered away from, from the church and from regular worship. And one day, uh, one day their son came to them. When he was eight years old, they'd sent him to a vacation Bible school. Their son came to them. And after the first day of vacation Bible school, uh, came and said, Mom, what's the Bible? What's the Bible? And at that moment, they knew. We've got to get back in church. We've got to get back in church. And so, uh, so, so it, it seems obvious, but if, if we want people, if we want our kids to learn about math and science, we send them to school. We bring them to school. If we want our kids to learn about Jesus, we bring them to church. And I'm seeing more and more drifting away from this. We had a generation that went to church every Sunday, day in, day out. As a matter of fact, even more so, there were the Christians that were the three to thrive Christians, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And then the next generation came along. And they go to church most Sundays. Most of the time, we're in church. The next generation comes along and they're a group that sends their kids to Sunday school, sends their kids to vacation Bible school, but they don't go themselves. And then that next generation comes along and they don't go at all. When their kids grow up, they may not even know who God is and if they learn about who Jesus is, they might learn about it from an enemy of the cross of Christ rather and a friend. See, what you do today, your actions that you do today, they can make an impact on your kids. They can make an impact on your grandkids. They can make an impact on your great-grandkids. And the list goes on. It goes on and on from there. And, it, it, and it's true that we need to bring our kids to church, but bringing them to Jesus is much more than about bringing them to church. If you bring them to church and, and Bible school on Sunday, that's two hours a week. Two hours a week, if you don't miss a single Sunday uh, in the year, you've got 104 hours a year. 104 hours a year. That's about two and a half weeks. Two and a half, three weeks in school. Think about that. Think about that. They're, they're getting influence from so many other places. If we want to bring our kids to Jesus, we need to also do it ourselves. They need to see that faith is not just something that we do on Sunday, but it's also something that we do every day. Every day of the week. 24-7. 365. We need to be following Jesus. I don't know if you know this, and I tell my students this at school sometimes, and they don't believe me. They look like look look at me like I'm crazy. But I tell them, you know, your parents are the number one influence on your lives. Your parents are the number one influence in your life. And if you think about this yourself, you think about it. It's really true. How many of you, when you think about it, you came to a point in your life where you realized, oh, I'm turning into my dad, or I'm turning into my mom. Or you find yourself saying things and then you remember, oh, <laughs> that's just what my folks used to say to me. Studies have shown that your religious beliefs, the number one influence of your religious beliefs are your parents. The number one influence of your political party affiliation are your parents. The number one, uh, number one influence of your work habits are your parents. So for you and me, those of us who are parents, that means we have a big responsibility. Train up a child in the way that he should go, as the proverb says. Or as, as Paul puts it, fathers, do not exasperate your children, but raise them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. If I'm the number one influence on my kids, what am I doing? 
What am I doing to influence them? Am I talking to them about God? Am I talking to them about the Bible? I think church is important. I think a family altar is important. What's a family altar? Well, it's a time when you as family, hopefully led by dad, if possible, but whoever is willing to lead it, you as a family get together every day. And share the scriptures together and share in a time of prayer. My confession to you today is, I'm not good at that. Most days go by without us doing it. And I realize even in this quarantine, it's been a while since we've sat down as a whole family, read the scripture together and prayed. All of us need to do that more. We need, we need to, to, to really convey to our kids that Jesus Christ is Lord. He's Lord of my whole life. And He needs to be Lord of yours as well. So if you want children to honor God, bring your children to Jesus. Second thing, if you want children that honor God, do not hinder them. Do not hinder them. Jesus says here, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them. Don't stop them from coming. Don't keep them away from me. We have no idea what the disciples' uh, intent was here. Uh, We know that uh, right after this, in verse uh, 15, it says, He went away, which tells me that Jesus was trying to go somewhere. He was trying to get on a trip. Uh, 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 He was trying to be on a trip, and so... These were a a distraction. The disciple says we can't be distracted by this. We have to be somewhere. But Jesus says, I don't care. Let the children come to me. Don't hinder them. Now, this is a cultural thing, I think, because in a disciple's day, children were seen and not heard. Children were on the lowest rung of the social ladder. And hindering them just meant ignoring them. Don't ignore them. Of course, there are kids today that are still on that lowest rung of the ladder. We see that all the time. We see kids that are uh, that grow up in abusive homes or we see uh, we, we see kids that are neglected by their parents. You know, how I wish that, a, that there would be Christians that would take those kids under their wing and show them what it really means to love God and to love each other. But on the other hand, many of the kids today are at the opposite end of the spectrum. We hear about helicopter parenting. We hear about sort of overprotective parents. But even apart from that, so many people are concerned with their children's welfare and, and they, they hold their children up and they say, I want to do anything I can for my children. It's a noble thing to do. But when you're doing that, remember not to hinder them. From coming to Jesus. Well, how do I mean by that? Well, where do you put the emphasis in your own life? Where do you put the emphasis in your own life? And this has always stuck with me for years. Years ago, I heard a sermon on the radio by Alistair Begg, and it was a Father's Day sermon. And he just simply asked this question. He said, how many of you dads, your kid knows your favorite baseball team or your favorite football team? And then he asked the second question. He said, okay, how many of them know your favorite hymn or your favorite passage of Scripture? And the point he was trying to make was, where do we put the emphasis in our life? What do our kids understand about us? Do they know that Christ is first and foremost in our life? Because if we're influencing them and they go with our interests as they get into adulthood, where are they going to put Jesus and that priority. And where do you put Jesus in your kid's life? Where do you put Jesus in your kid's life? I know what I'm going to say is not going to make uh, some people happy, but I think there are people that need to hear it. Before this quarantine, uh, before this quarantine happened, 
what we saw, what I would see constantly uh, is people who would miss church and they would miss church for a ball game or they miss church because there was a birthday party or they would miss church uh, for any number of reasons. And I always want to know, what priorities are you teaching your kids? What priorities are you teaching your grandkids when you do that? Well, you can see you can see where it goes from here. I mean, most of us would never dream of having our kids miss school. You know, our, our kids, oh yeah, we want you to be at school. If, if a kid says, I don't feel like going today, unless they're really sick, they've got to be really sick, they're going. But if your son or daughter says, I don't want to go to church today, well, it's his decision, or her, it's her decision. Well, it's not his or her decision whether or not they eat. If they stop eating, take them to a doctor because something is wrong. It's not his or her decision whether or not to go to school and learn about math or science. Because the kids have to know those things. See, kids have to know about Jesus, too. Don't hinder them. Don't hinder them. See, kids are like adults. We all get selfish. We all want to do what we want to do. But we all have to have someone in our life that helps us to do what God wants us to do. And if that's the case, maybe you have a kid, maybe you have a grandkid, maybe you're the only person in that kid's life that will help them to do just that. So help them. Don't hinder them. If you want children that honor God, don't hinder them. And the third thing here, remember that the kingdom of God belongs to children and those like them. The kingdom of God belongs to children and those like them. He says, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. To such belongs the kingdom of heaven. In Matthew 18, and when he was teaching, very similar teaching on the teaching of children, he also compares the little ones to his disciples. You see, it's not just the children, it's everybody who's forgotten, everybody who's ignored, uh, everybody who, who needs the Lord and confesses his need. To people like that, that's who the kingdom of God belongs. When I was preaching on the Matthew 18 chapter, I think I shared with you um, that the question has been raised, you know, what is it about children that make them fit for the kingdom of God? And some people say, well, it's their innocence. Well, if you say innocence, then you don't have kids, do you? <laughs> you know, little children are not innocent. <laughs> A preschooler can lie with the best of them. Uh, they can throw tantrums, they can throw fits, they can disobey. They can do all things, sign of things to disappoint us. In a lot of ways, they're a lot like us, adults. So what is it about children that make them fit for the kingdom of heaven? Well, the answer is, is that children are naturally dependent. They're naturally dependent. They must rely on adults for their survival. They must rely on adults for their survival. And that's why they're fit for the kingdom of heaven. Because only those who are dependent can be in the kingdom of God. See, children are nat naturally dependent. And we raise them to be independent. We want them to be independent. We want them to be able to work hard for themselves. We want them to be able to make a living. We want them to be able uh, to go out on their own. And make their way in the world. But we need to not just raise our kids to be independent. We need to raise our kids to be dependent on God. See, they start out dependent on us. Let's raise them to be dependent on God. I don't think that it is contradictory to say that uh, we raise our kids to be independent and we raise them to be dependent uh, 
J.D. Tant, a Texas preacher uh, back in the late 1800s, early 1900s. There were many times he went to places he didn't have uh, any money to go and different churches would say to him, well, if you come here and preach a, a, a gospel, meeting for us uh, we'll uh, you know give you such and such amount of money uh, and when he get got there the money wasn't there he still preached anyway and this happened to him several times and he told his son through all this I learned to depend on myself and I learned to depend on God and I learned not to depend on brethren who pay cash for tobacco, but buy the preaching on credit. See, we don't have to, we don't have to depend necessarily on others because you and I, we let each other down. It just happens. Parents, we let our kids down. Our kids let us down. But when kids come from this natural state of, of independence, or excuse me, natural state of dependence, and as we lead them, let's lead them to dependence on God. Full reliance on Him. Simple reliance. Faith. Belief in Jesus Christ. Trust. Childlike trust. That He is going to do what He says He's going to do. Children that honor God. Ultimately, ultimately, it's between that child and God what he's going to do. Is she going to follow Jesus or not? Will he be faithful to God when he gets older or not? That's a decision your child, your grandchild is going to have to make. You can't make that decision. But what you can do is you can honor God. Honor God by bringing them to Jesus, by not hindering them from Jesus, and by realizing, by realizing that it's dependence on God that makes all of us fit for the kingdom of God. I can remember holding all of my kids when they were first born and looking in and just being filled with joy. And there's that hymn, Because He Lives, and, and that those words of that hymn came alive to me. It says, uh, how sweet to hold a newborn baby and fill the pride and joy He gives. But sweeter still the calm assurance this child can face on certain days because Christ lives. See, Jesus Christ lives. He lives, and even today, he's saying, let the children come to me. And don't hinder them. For such is the kingdom of God. And he says to all of us, he says, come to me, all ye who are weak and heavy laden. I will give you rest. Let's pray. Father, we want to honor you. We want families. We want kids and dads and moms, grandma, grandpa, aunt, uncle, neighbor, everybody to honor you. So lead us. Help us by your spirit to do just that. More today than we did yesterday. More tomorrow than we are today. Forgive us when we do wrong and help us become more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. If you are in that category today where you're hearing Jesus call, maybe for the first time, come to me. All. For God so loved the world. That's how many? All of them. The whole world. I pray that you'd make that decision today. Come to Jesus. Put your faith in Him. Repent of your sins and be baptized. In the name of Jesus Christ.
for the forgiveness of your sins. God is calling you today. I hope you'll get a hold of me if you need to make that decision. You can call me, Dustin Wells, 217-918-2140, and I'll talk to you about it. God bless you, and have a great week.